Hey guys, it's Matt with TTPOA, and we are here with another video. I'm sitting to my left, Leif Babin. Uh, I don't think you need an introduction, but I'm going to introduce you anyhow. Longtime Navy SEAL and an expert at leadership. We'll say an expert at leadership, right? Like that's your passion, and uh, if, if, if somebody's going to get into leadership, I, I thank you, I commend you and Jocko because uh, two an amazing books, Extreme Ownership and the Dichotomy of Leadership, I highly recommend them. Leif, Leif, thank you for being here. Thanks for having me, Matt. I, I, I would say I'm only an expert in leadership if I've made about every mistake you could possibly make. And I've, I've, I've been very humbled by our experiences on the battlefield and, and, and thinking through what I would have done differently and got a chance to pass those lessons on to the next generation of leaders and try to make sure they didn't make the same mistakes. You know, somebody told me a long time ago, you got to get some stuff wrong before you get it right. And so I tell people, learn from my mistakes, you know, or you give them the answers to the tests and uh, hopefully they use it. So. Um, what was y'all's draw to writing the first book? That's a great question. We, Jocko retired in 2010, and uh, I left active duty in, in uh, 2011. And we had had a chance to interact with some, uh, some, some corporations, you know, out, outside the, the military. It was my first experience. I mean, Jocko had enlisted uh, right out of high school. I joined the Naval Camp right out of high school, so we really never know anything but the military. And the recognition that the leadership lessons that we learned in combat applied everywhere. You know, whether you're leading a business, whether you're leading a, a law yeah. enforcement group um, in the first responder world or, or anywhere. Uh, and, and so that that was really the recognition for us of, hey, we need to pass these leadership lessons on. I mean, both, you know, Jocko had run training for the entire West Coast SEAL teams when we'd come back from this very violent deployment to Ramadi, Iraq, to the Battle of Ramadi in 2006. Uh, I ran training for every single officer that graduated from our training pipeline, what was called the Junior Officer Training Course, so a, a five-week course, four, four weeks of classroom, week-long uh, uh, field training exercise. Yeah. And, and so as we started to work with companies, we passed those lessons on, and we had a chance to work with uh, law enforcement groups all across the United States and even several uh, uh, from around the world as well uh, in places like Canada and Australia uh, where they've taken these same lessons uh, and to help them lead more effectively in what they're trying to do. I think the title alone, Extreme Ownership, I, I, I see a lot of leaders that um, they don't fall on the sword, you know, and I don't think they realize, like, hey, uh, this is what happened, they own up to it, and they real, they don't realize that they get that respect, because that's something you saw on your side of things where you kind of learn, I've seen, you know, you've told stories, and so has Jocko, about that stuff, is, is that something you, you realized along the way? Jocko's really a student of leadership, I learned, I learned to... Everything I needed, to, you know, everything I needed to be the combat leader, I needed to be on the battlefield from Jocko, and and he, as a student of leadership, I think he was recognizing what worked and what didn't work. Yeah. Uh, and I certainly recognize that as well from my own experiences. We didn't use the term extreme ownership during our time uh, in in the Navy. It kind of something that materialized as Jocko was working with some leaders, and he was trying to get them to to accept that they were responsible for everything that happened on their team, and, and so that was a term that that captured that um, in, in a huge way. Uh, but it's something that we saw every single, every single team that was successful. You you had some element. Of, it doesn't have to necessarily be the senior person at the top of the organization, but there was some element of leaders. And, and we use the term leader to apply to everyone. If you interact yeah. with a human in any capacity, you could take these leadership principles we're talking about uh, to 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 influence them in some way uh, for the better, for the good of, of, of the team and the mission. And and so the best teams that we saw, there was some level of leadership that was taking ownership not making excuses, not casting blame, not pointing fingers, but actually getting problems solved. Uh, and, and so this term, as we see it, uh, you, you're always going to find this term, whether you use the term extreme ownership or not, yeah. this is actually what works. I mean, if you're going to cast blame, if you're going to make excuses, if you're going to point fingers, then, then no one actually solves the problems. That becomes the culture of the organization. It's, it's a bunch of blame casting, a bunch of excuse making. Problems don't get solved, so therefore problems get worse. And usually the performance of that team will spiral downward until it may get so bad that the leaders eventually get fired in that organization. And then oftentimes when we see a new leader come in and take over, that, that performance would turn around drastically. Uh, and you see a, a unit that was really struggling all of a sudden become great because they had people who were taking ownership of problems and getting those problems solved. So what advice do you have for somebody that's going to be first time getting into those leadership positions, whether it's on law enforcement or junior NCO or, you know, lieutenant that, um, you know, they're going in, they've been tasked with that responsibility, like now I gotta step it up as a leader. Like what advice, what's like the most one sound advice thing that you could give them? I, my advice is uh, be humble or get humbled. I mean, that's that's the bottom line. If you're not humble, I mean, that, the, humility is the most important quality in a leader. 
Uh, and the reason is because when you're not humble, I mean, you can't listen to anybody else, you can't learn from anybody else. And when you're stepping into a leadership position, every, you know, particularly if you're, you're inexperienced or you're, you're fairly junior, or this is the first time you're, you're, you're being promoted up the chain, everybody knows that you don't have the answers. They already know that. So you might as well not pretend uh, because they know that you don't have the answer. So, uh, so if you're humble and you listen to other people and you lean on people's experience, I think that's a that's a uh, that's the best pathway forward for success. And when you can, when you are humble, we can keep your ego in check. Then then you can you can learn about new methods, new ways of doing things, educate yourself, lean on other people's experiences, and it allows you to ultimately fight against complacency. So you're not not ever getting complacent. You're not ever thinking that you're better than you are, which is only setting you up for for. Uh, for failure, yeah. and then most importantly, you can look yourself in the mirror, uh, and and you can do an honest self-assessment. That you know, you can look at yourself and realize, here's what I, I did. Here's why I screwed up. Here's what I can actually improve on. And that way, you can actually get better all the time. The person that's not humble is the person that is uh, is never going to learn, never going to grow, never going to get better. And they certainly can't take ownership of problems to get those problems solved. And what's interesting to me is when you see the most experienced leaders out there, they are without question, the most humble. And, and if, I, if I, particularly like in the military world, same as in the, in the, in the first responder world too. I mean, when you're talking about uh, tactical officers in law enforcement uh, or, or, or some of the highest levels of our, our military, the people who, if you could, you could tell right away, the people who are super arrogant, that are super cocky, they've never truly been tested. Even if they've had a few experiences, they've never truly been tested because those who've truly been tested they're going to get beaten. They're going to get outmaneuvered. They're going to have underprepared. They're going to encounter situations that they, they had not even foreseen might unfold. And so uh, to realize just how quickly things can go south, yeah. just how hard those tactical situations you have to deal with actually are. Uh, and I think that's going to set people up for success so that they're, they're willing to train hard, prepare themselves, get, you know, take on new technologies, new methodologies, learn from others who've uh, suffered from, from uh, you know, a similar experience. Evolve, right? And they yeah. get better as a result. Absolutely, evolve. What about servant leadership? Where does that fit in? Is that something, do you, would you label yourself that way or is that a different style? Of, I think that's a huge part of the leadership that, that we talk about. And what's interesting about, I, I never even heard that term uh, yeah. until I left the military. Um, and it's obviously been around for, for decades. And But what's interesting is, you know, the opposite of servant leadership. I mean, just servant leadership is, you know, as I understood the, the terminology, just simply means that you're, you're there to serve the team, right? You're not there, the team is not there to serve you. And I would just define that as simply good leadership. I mean, that's what effective leadership actually okay. looks like. Yeah. I think that, you know, it, so I think it's a great term. I think it's a great understanding. I think it's actually sad that someone had to define a term like that. It kind of just the same be way, a good leader, it, 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 right? It, well, in, in the military, we call that like the ticket puncher, right? This okay. person that's there, right. that, yeah. I'm here to get promoted. I'm here to kind of step on people and, you know, to, to move my way up the chain of command. Uh, that would be the opposite of servant leadership. In, in the same way, it's kind of sad that we had to define the term extreme ownership as well, because most people should understand that, look, you're responsible for everything that happens on the team. But when you realize that you're there for the benefit of the team, the benefit of the mission, and you put the team in the mission first, I mean, that, that's the only way that you're going to be successful. And certainly the leaders that get that actually get promoted up the chain of command, it's great to see when those things actually happen, when organizations promote the right people. Uh, and often those people who are putting the team, the mission first, end up getting promoted uh, yeah. faster and quicker above the chain than those who are simply focused on their own uh, you know, promotion opportunities. So we've gone to stratification now, so that I think should address some of that stuff too, so that helps out. But um, so other than jujitsu, what are you doing now? What's going on? Well, I, I'll tell you, uh, jujitsu is something I didn't prioritize for uh, a long time. <laughs> yeah. And uh, I might be the longest reigning, uh, I was probably the longest reigning white belt out there, <laughs> now probably the longest reigning blue belt out there. But uh, I, I think that that's something that I think, you know, as a law enforcement officer, I, I, everybody should be trained in jujitsu. You know, Absolutely I, I think agree. it's a, a life saving skill. Uh, and it also helps you in so many ways so that you can detach from situations, you know, getting spun up and getting emotional or angry about things or really getting so focused on something that you can't see the bigger picture is, is a real problem. Uh, and I think particularly from a leadership perspective. So jujitsu actually helps me there. And I've, I, in, in, I, I am, I'm doing, I'm trying to do a better job these days of prioritizing training there. Uh, CrossFit and high intensity workouts, I think are something yeah. that are crucial. And you know, when I see people uh, in the law enforcement world or in the military that are struggling, um, with some of their experiences they deal, deal with, oftentimes I see that there is, just like in my own life, when I've struggled with things, 
it's it, it, it starts to develop into uh, a, a bad nutrition yeah. uh, and, and, and bad workout habits. And when I'm not training physically, uh, I think there's a direct correlation between your, you know, your confidence and your physical abilities. Uh, and, and the more, that, even with serious injuries and things like that, required like so many law enforcement officers out there, if uh, if, if you're training uh, and you're active, it, it enables you to, to continue to do so much more. Yeah. Uh, and I think that that self confidence in the physical world is directly uh, applicable, in, you know, psychologically and emotionally as well. You can handle stress better. So I, I think n nutrition and fitness are a huge piece uh, of what everybody should be focused on. I'm a firm believer that if a uh, law enforcement officer is more confident in combatives, they're less likely to escalate force or deal with it or jump to something because they're more confident in their abilities and they're able to do things differently. So we don't go that path. But let's get on to something fun. All right, we're going to do some rapid fire. Right let's, see what, let's see what you got. So Favorite movie. Favorite movie? Well, if I didn't say Navy SEALs no, with uh, Charlie Sheen, no. that I might get... Uh, How many SEALs are rolling over up. right now? <laughs> uh, I would say I, one of my favorite movies of all time is probably uh, uh, Master and Commander. I thought that was a really all cool right. movie, really cool leadership, uh, you know, leadership on the high seas. Probably uh, the movie that was most quoted in Taskin and Bruiser days and still is something that Jocko and I quote often is The Big Lebowski. <laughs> Good yeah. call. Um, other than jiu-jitsu, hobby. What else are you doing hobby-wise? Hunting and fishing is one of my favorite things to do. I haven't made enough time to do that in recent years. Yeah. Uh, and as Jace Robertson from Duck Dynasty fame uh, said, if you're too busy to hunt and fish, you're too busy. Uh, and I think as I've, I've got kids now and trying to spend time with my kids in the outdoors, I think it's, it's super important. Favorite gun? My favorite gun. I mean, I've uh, the, uh, the the Colt M4A2 is uh, certainly our, uh, our 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 go to. Um, Mark 19. Mark 19. <laughs> I mean, that's, well, if, if you want to go in from a broader sense, uh, I would say that on the battlefield, the, my favorite weapon to employ was the uh, the 120 millimeter main gun on a uh, M1 Abrams tank. All right. Uh, all right. That was uh, outstanding, <laughs> and 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 actually the the easiest way to defeat. Uh, it surges that were holed up behind concrete buildings and, and enemy snipers. Touche, touche. Um, and then uh, favorite book, and you can't, you can't use your book. <laughs> About Face, David Hackworth. Well played, well played. Hey guys, Leif Babin, check out their books. TTPOA, it's going to be here at the conference. Leif, thank you so awesome. much. It's an Thanks honor. Thank you, sir. Glad to be with you. Yeah.